Welcome, everybody. We're going to start our webinar now. I, uh, I want to welcome you to the second spring livestock drought outlook live webinar that we're doing. Today, we're going to do uh, have some discussions around uh, feed considerations for our cow herds here in the state. I'm Zach Carlson, Beef Extension Specialist um, here, and joining me is Carl Hoppe, the Extension uh, Livestock Specialist here at Carrington. And in, online, we have uh, Dr. Brian Parman joining us too, and he's going to fill us in uh, in the second half here of our webinar on a little bit more of the economic side of things. But if uh, some housekeeping to cover here right away, um, this will be recorded and posted. And so you can find the recording in a few days through our NDSU extension social media links as well as our NDSU Extension YouTube channel. And so I encourage you to go back if we cover something too quick or, or whatnot and, and wanna reca recap that. I will also encourage you if you missed last week, Dr. Kevin Sedevec and Miranda Meehan had a good discussion on pasture outlook and Adnan Akuz did a great job of kind of capturing um, the moisture that we've seen over this winter period and kind of gave us a spring outlook. And so if you missed last week's webinar, I encourage you in those same social media links and the YouTube channel, go back and find that recording, which is posted now. And so with that, though, I think we will get started, Carl, and kind of, um, you know, the um, looking at the um, drought outlook for this week and kind of where we're at for that. Essentially, um, last week in the, um, Dr. Kevin Sedevac kind of, I think he highlighted a really good point that we'll get to here. And he, he did a really great job of kind of looking at the, the moisture that was captured in the fall in the, uh, across the state. And as, of course, we're kind of dealing with this, this drought outlook in the central to Western half of the state, particularly up into the Northwest. And I, I think he did a great job of talking through, you know, the impacts and how severe um, the, the impact of spring grazing can be on our, basically our, our forage production, not knowing, of course, what precipitation we're going to receive in the spring, summer, and fall, but how impactful it can be if we don't have our pasture turnout right. And so, again, looking back at that webinar, I encourage you to go there, but I think it set the stage really well for us to talk about if we don't. If you're in an area where we don't have a lot of precipitation, uh, haven't had some for years at this point, and looking at uh, you know a bleak outlook into spring precipitation while hoping for moisture, I think it's a it, this is a good time to talk about how can we adjust and make some feed decisions uh, that will kind of lead us into uh, being able to delay pasture turnout so we're not affecting that spring growth. And but that is not an easy thing to do, Carl, because what we're dealing with is some, some really high feed prices, right? Well, we certainly are. And just being able to get a hold of feed um, has been a real challenge. Uh, there's been a, a, a drought during the whole upper whole Midwest region that we have here. And because of that drought, there wasn't much feed produced last year. And now we're just short on feed. We had a bad winter as well, meaning that it was not, uh, at least in our neck of the woods here around Carrington, we had several blizzards throughout the whole winter, more than normal, a lot of gusty winds. So it was bad weather conditions. So we fed more feed all winter long. Now we're getting to be springtime. Uh, there's not a lot of extra feed around. Uh, so our option is to keep feeding the cattle or like we've got in the slide there, sell. And that's a tough decision when you're a cow-calf person to want to move some cows, but certainly can. We've dealt with this before. As you can see in the slide there, that was actually from 2017, I believe. We've had droughts before in North Dakota. And we've persevered through them. It's just, uh, we got another one that we're dealing with now and it's still lingering on. So uh, feed considerations are a big deal right now. So that's let's right. move on. I've kind of thought about this in terms of if we're gonna to have to continue feeding, what does that feeding situation look like? Is it a supplementation on pasture to try to reduce forage intake a little bit? Or are we completely substitute feeding in a sense and, and, and actually you know keeping those cows somewhere in a, say, a sacrifice pasture or in a pen setting uh, up by the barns or something like that and feeding them a limit-fed high-energy diet? Or is it sending those, uh, those animals off somewhere where drought isn't impacting uh, that area as much and we can feed them 
at a cost for there. And so we'll kind of go through these things and, but, but ultimately trying to find that balance between reducing that, that grazing pressure. Uh, but at the same time, trying to find an economic way to do it when feed prices are just that's very, very high. That's a hard decision. Although I just got to back up and say with our dry lot or, or if you're not going to take cattle to pasture, you can feed these cows in dry lot. And we've actually done dry lot feeding of our cow herd here at Carrington for 30 to 40 years. So it's, it's something that's been done routinely. Um, not a lot of people do it just because of the cost, but it can be done. I should mention too, as we move forward here, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll be able to answer those throughout the entire uh, discussion here today. Yeah. Um, well, when, when, when we talk about feeding cows and the hard part now is, so when did you calf? If you calf in January and February, you have some different decisions than the guy that's just starting to calf right now. So we need to take that in context. So just this one issue of what do we do? Um, it really depends upon when calving season. So as calving season started. So one of the first things we've got up here is the January, February calving. There's a few people that still do that in North Dakota. They've got barns they find out to work extremely well in their situation because in the springtime, that's when they start farming. So this wintertime calving works out really well. Actually for them right now, um, if they're short on feed, maybe they sh or short on grass because there's not much out there, may they consider early weaning the calves in May, which is just next month. They've already got enough feed on hand to feed these cows because they're fall calvers. I mean, excuse me, January, February calvers. So they're used to feeding lactating cows in the wintertime. Um, put the calves in dry lot. And then at that time, you can either put the cows out on grass. Their nutrient requirements are going to be a lot less because they're not lactating. Or if you don't have any grass, you can put them out on, out, put them in a dry lot and feed them there. If you're a March early April calving operation, well, maybe you consider early weaning them in July. Uh, the calves need to be old enough in order to be really be weaned off the cow, but that means um, you're planning on feeding them, them right now because you really don't have much choice. Uh, so if you're gonna feed them, probably they'll be in dry lot and in July time, if you don't have grass, you can certainly wean them and put them into dry lot for the calves and both for the cows. Or if you do have enough grass by July, it happens to rain, then you run the cows out on grass. A lot of flexibility in that situation. Just give it a little bit of time. And like uh, we spoke a little bit earlier, we can always supplement. So if you really don't want to early wean and there isn't much grass out in pasture, you can certainly take the cows out to pasture and provide some extra feed there or rotationally graze or do some type of extra grazing thing or feeding thing that will get them through. So it's some options, but we got one more scenario though yet. And that, that really is, we got May, June calvers. A lot of us old guys have decided that calving in the winter time is too much work. We need to let nature come to, come to place and we're gonna be calving in May and June, which means um, we don't have much choice in what we're gonna do with these cows and their calves. We're gonna have to supplement some extra feed to them. We're gonna have to feed them out in grass. We could actually leave them in dry lot and feed them there, but we don't really have an option to really um, not feed them as much feed. We have to procure feed for these late calving cows because they're coming into their peak nutritional needs when they start um, milking up uh, fairly well in six to eight weeks after the calves are born. Um, one thing I always need to be concerned about is that cows don't lose weight when we're in this type of scenario. It's really easy to underfeed cows and maybe you can do that for a little bit. I'm not sure if uh, Zach would, would encourage that, but we'll talk about that later. But if they lose too much weight in this type of situation, lactation, um, it might affect your breed up. In other words, the number of cows that are pregnant as time goes on. I always got to remind people, and uh, that is you got to look at the stage production of a cow. When she's lactating, that's the most amount of nutrition she needs. And if your cows are like the January, February calvers, uh, they're already past their lactational peak. And weaning them will save you some, some energy, okay? Calf can be weaned at three to four months of age. That's called early weaning. Um, that can certainly be done. But if you're calving in March or April, you're in your peak lactation within a month. If you're calving in May and June, your peak lactation is yet to even happen. That means your energy required in the diet is going to be the highest and you're still approaching that. It means you, you, we really need to look at the ration and provide some extra feed. But I always like to put up this slide to remind you that early lactation takes the most amount of energy. Late lactation takes less. When they're weaned, 
it goes down to a maintenance ration. And it'll be a long time between now and when the cow is pregnant and there's six or seven months of a six or eight, nine months of gestation uh, before nutrient requires continue up. But if lactation is ahead of you, your peak demand for nutrients is still going to be showing up here. So maybe I should let Zach talk for a minute, but if you don't mind, Zach, I'll just continue on. No, no, by all means. <laughs> Thanks. I'd like to talk about feed, feed prices. Energy is what our cow herds need. We need extra energy in our cows. Need them to keep growing, uh, producing milk, get the calves to grow. When we look at the energy costs, it's not based off the oil price. It's based off the corn price. And our corn price is what sets the prices for all feeds based on their energy content. Why is corn set the price? It's easily stored, it's transported. You can move it across state borders or in rail cars, whatever the case is. Uh, we can do a lot of things with corn grain. Um, you can have it as dry grain or you can have it high moisture if you put it up in the fall time. Ear leaching corn silage is certainly something you can think about, but it's too late for our, our season right now if you're trying to look for some. Uh, normally, if people do have some corn silage for sale, you can certainly sell it, it'll work. Just either gonna have to repackage it if you bring it home and wanna keep it for a while, or you need to feed it up rather soon. Um, the other thing is stover. You know, we got the corn and grain, but there's still stover out in these fields. And um, we've had a pretty dry winter and who knows what spring's gonna be, but eventually it's gonna to have to dry up enough for us to plant. And there are people that do put up stover in the springtime before planting. So that is a feed resource that might be capitalized if you're short someplace. Carl, we've got a question here mm -hmm. and I'm going to defer it to you simply from, I know you have a good idea of kind of where things are at here in the state for hay price. Yeah, I, I see the question. It's uh, what's hay selling for in North Dakota? Report of a Tuesday auction sale near Lair It's $280 a bale for a 1600 pound alfalfa bale. Um, wow, that's really high when you consider corn's $250 a ton. And then you're going to need to add freight and processing on top of it. Um, but, you know, alfalfa hay has got extra protein as well. It does have some energy. And cattle are ruminants, so alfalfa or hay is something they need to have in their diet. They need to have some roughage. Um, $280 a bale certainly is a demand issue. If it's third cutting alfalfa that has a relative bead value of $200 or $250, uh, it could easily be priced that high. That's definitely what it's worth. But if it's uh, a relative feed value of over $100 or $150, uh, well, 100, that still um, seems kind of like a steep price. There might be other opportunities to go for. Uh, hay is a really tough thing to put a price on in North Dakota because we don't have necessarily routine hay auctions throughout the year. Uh, if you go into Minnesota, uh, there are some hay auctions that are routinely held every year, every month, and you get a pretty good pricing what hay is sold for because people raise hay to be sold. Around here, it's more uh, of an issue of... Um, we're in a situation where you need to buy hay. How much do we have to pay? And you can look at that $280 a ton and say, you know, if they were going to buy it at a hay auction at $200 a ton and add on another $80 worth of freight, that's the same as buying it from your neighbor at $280. So do what you can as long as you know what the feed quality is. If you do know what your feed quality is, um, I, I, feed test, that's the best way to know what you have. And by all means, please do it. Is there a good reference or can you think of, you know, like for a baseline as we go through the year to check, right? You have some references, some auctions that you check into uh, to kind of give you an idea of where those prices are. What are those auctions that you kind of use? To the, the auction I tend to routine, routinely go to because as close as North Dakota is the, is the hay auction at Sauk Center, Minnesota. And um, one of the things they do, uh, if, the county extension agent there provides a calculation based on relative feed value on the different types of feeds. And I hate to report, I think it's somewhere around a dollar or a dollar two. It would have to look at the latest report. That's what the value is per relative feed value. So if the price was a dollar two and the relative feed value was 200, which is extremely high, well, dollar two times 200 is what, uh, 240, $240 a ton. And then you'd have freight on top of it. Of course, 200 relative feed value is, is that's like third cut and candy fed to sheep. I mean, that, that's the good stuff. Uh, the deer will find it out in your field first before the cows ever will. But uh, that's some pretty high quality feed. That's normal. There are other hay auctions in Minnesota 
as well. Um, we have a hard time identifying hay auctions in North Dakota, although there are a few mm -hmm. that routinely are around. Energy is important in a ration, but so is protein. A lot of times when we buy energy, we buy protein with it. And if we're needing an 8% crude protein ration for our gestating cow, uh, a lot of our feeds will tend to eat, have that, except for corn stover, wheat straw, some other, other byproduct feeds. But in reality, um, when you get to a lactation ration, they're gonna need 11, 12% crude protein, and we're gonna have to add extra protein to the ration. We have a lot of production available in North Dakota through the oil seed mills. Um, they're crushed here in North Dakota, Endelin, Belva, uh, Car uh, excuse me, West Fargo, all have soybean mill, canola mill, sunflower mill, linseed mill crushed at certain times of the year. It's available. A lot of it's being shipped out of state. We do have other protein feeds like uh, distillers grains, and that has lead to the top of the number one use for added extra protein. Field peas work quite well if you can procure them, bind them. Uh, lentils work in that same situation as well. Alfalfa, like we just had with that question, is a nice protein source as well, the energy source. Don't forget the clovers, but if you do buy sweet clover, bees realize that you can have sweet clover poisoning, and that is not a nice situation in a cow herd if they're afflicted with uh, sweet clover poisoning. We can feed some oil seeds like soybeans and sunflower seeds, uh, canola, even flax, provide extra protein as a true seed. Uh, just be careful to limit the amounts that you put in the ration so you don't over uh, provide too much fat in the ration because soybeans come with fat as well. So you limit to whatever protein supplementation you need and you'll probably be okay at about three, four or five pounds per head. If you go above that, you might end up with some uh, decreased in performance due to excess fat in the ration. Like I said, we have lots of options with feedstuffs in North Dakota. We've done a lot of research here at the Carrington Research Extension Center on uh, co-products that we can buy from North Dakota. Of course, there's been a lot of other projects done in North Dakota too. Um, I just got to make a comment. We've got a publication that's been around quite a while. It just recently was updated by my colleague, Zach. And uh, it's, it's our publication called Alternative Feeds for Ruminants. AS 1182. So it describes a lot of different feeds. I really like the ending because it has feed composition tables. So the feed composition tables, rather than finding a book or going online, these are values produced for North Dakota from North Dakota that are included in this. It's available online. It's available in print. Go to your county extension agent's office. You can probably get it in print there. Do you have any other comments you'd like to share about that, Zach? Because it sure has a lot of different feed stuffs in there. It's quite in-depth and encompassing in terms of alternative. So there's a lot of those unique um, feeds that we get questions on, even, you know, think about last summer and things like that. A lot of that is entailed in, in that document. It's 20 some pages long. And so certainly encourage people to take a look at that, go to their agent and, and get a copy and you can find it online as well. And the, there'll be a link in the chat um, to find that publication. A little, a little side note here, our previous predecessor, Ladon Johnson, developed this in, uh, as a respond to drought back in the uh, 1980s, about 34 years ago, 88, really? that type of thing. He originally started out as a fact sheet or a quick sheet at that time in response to drought because people are wondering, can we feed kosher? Well, we put it in writing, you certainly can, but that's the hair, that's the heart behind it. It certainly expanded from then. It's a great resource and thanks for updating it, Zach. Uh, I guess I'll keep talking here and say going. one more thing we here. That's, uh, we've got some co-products in North Dakota. This is the map I always like to share. If I go to other states and talk about co-products, they don't have near the breadth and number of co-products we have in North Dakota. It, it's, it's almost staggering. They might have ethanol plants, but where do you find ethanol plants, wheat mills, um, beet pulp or sugar factories, uh, high fructose corn syrup factories, uh, potato waste, excuse me, potato processing, uh, even malt production, barley malt has been done in North Dakota. We have all those available in North Dakota. And if you're living near the Red River Valley, you've, you've probably figured these all out because freight is a lot closer for you than if you lived in the Western part of the state. Although if you look at your drought map, you quickly find out that we're not really in a drought out here, but we are out there. So freights are, is a big deal. And I think that's when you find out the ethanol plants that are located in the western part of the state are pretty well booked up on, on availability because people have sought them. I know the uh, beet pulp out of the Sydney, Montana plant is usually booked out a year in advance because ranchers realize it's a great feed to have. 
So, um, and I do like to point out that North Dakota, we've got our own bank. We actually own our own feed mill, excuse me, wheat mill also. And the wheat mill, the North Dakota State Mill in Grand Forks is the largest mill in one location in the world. So that kind of underscores how much wheat mids we produce in our region. And of course, we've got one on our back door here at Carrington right now that produces wheat mids as well. So there's a lot of opportunity for different feeds available in North Dakota, and you certainly can work for it, work for them if you certainly want them. All right. So with that and kind of talking, maybe to kind of go back a little bit, we've talked about, you know, potential supplementation, uh, bringing in energy feeds, protein feeds, maybe uh, as a way to reduce our pressures on our pastures. Uh, if we if we think or we know we're going to see uh, reduced pr production in those pastures, at least here in the springtime. And so we we did mention Carl covered early weaning too, and that certainly can be considered you know a reduction in the when we do wean and those cows are no longer lactating. We've taken that pressure off uh, the energy requirements and protein requirements. But what I've what I've got here this slide, um, if we think. We can, in, in, and it does vary a little bit depending on what grain we're using and how much starch is in that grain, for instance, corn or barley and things like that. But, but then even into concentrates and think about, uh, you know, we highlighted distillers grains or even bringing in soy holes in that sense or something like that. Roughly estimating it's about a pound of grain can substitute about a half pound of alfalfa. That table I've got there in the center is actually some a uh, summarization of some old data, but really good data on basically, it does depend though on what the quality of your forage is. So if we're thinking about trying to, to feed some, some mm -hmm. feed, bring some feeds in to reduce pressure, either right now on our hay inventory or reduce pressure on grazing. Um, I, what I've got there are those, that forage replacement is, is a, in a decimal form for one pound of grain slash concentrate would equate to replacing their in low quality forages about a quarter pound of that forage. And so as we see that actually as our, our, our values get higher as that, as that quality of hay or quality of that pasture gets greater if we're using quality uh, crude protein as a proxy for quality in that sense. So as our protein gets higher, we actually get a better replacement closer to that one pound of, of energy or protein feed to replace about a half pound of, of pasture. And I'll go through some research here in the next couple of slides, actually highlighting some work that's been done on evaluating that. But I do wanna put out there, we typically, for guidelines on supplementing in pasture situations, when we talk about mostly our, our grain supplementation, but even into concentrates, distillers grain, soy hulls, um, our, high, our beet pulp, maybe even you know, our, our energy feeds, we really kind of want to stick around if we're still trying to graze pastures or, or use hay as our primary energy. Um, stick around that 0.4% body weight. So 1,400 pound cow, it's about six pounds of, of grain. And, and that really just gets to a point where at some point we're going to see less um, energy capture from the forage that's being digested as the bacteria population shifts, favoring uh, more towards that supplement you're providing. And so to balance that, we really kind of don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves and, and have too much of an energy feed when we're talking supplementation on pasture. And there's some good work by Iowa, actually, where they had some heifers that they fed 1%, a little more in their body weight of dried distillers grains. And they looked at kind of the, the pressure on the pasture, and they saw about a 20% reduction in the early springtime when they were providing that distillers grains. Uh, on forage production. So they kind of estimated that to be forage intake. They had more production in their pastures when they had that supplementation of distillers grains, just kind of you're replacing some of the energy those animals need um, from the pasture by supplementing it through those, those various feeds. Before you go on, just like to, so the really issue on the first part of this slide is that we need to have enough crude protein in the ration to utilize the energy that's provided. So while I talked about we need energy for our cows, don't forget we need to provide enough protein so they can use energy. Is that right? I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Carl. Yeah, for sure what you, you, you have to make sure, because in my mind, a drought situation usually means you're looking for energy. 
but you have to meet the protein needs before you can uh, move into any type of energy supplementation. And you're ab absolutely right. right. When we're thinking of providing some energies or even protein and energy, right? The silos grains, and we'll show you that in a little mm. bit. It's a really great way to both meet your protein and energy in that way. Great point. So if we think about substitution, um, and, and so not supplementing, but actually substituting, Nebraska did some work and actually looked at it trying to actually replace a portion of pasture with pretty much like a, a, a diet. So we're, we're at levels that are kind of, um, what they did was they compared basically what they called their control stocking rate compared to double. So they wanted to see if they could increase the number of cows they had on the same pasture, but provide in that double group, that double stocking rate, they provided half what they anticipated was half their diet through this mm. blend of 70% corn stover, 30% modified distillers grains mixture. And so they provided 15 pounds, almost 16 on a dry matter basis of this mix in hopes that they could actually reduce the amount of forage intake on the pasture. And, in, and of course then double their stocking rate. Well, I think this has a great complement to when we're looking at drought situations and we think or anticipate we're seeing 20 to 30% reduction of forage production, you know, start looking at some of these th uh, alternatives. And, and I think substitution could potentially be a great way to do that. Um, you know, specifically when we're providing this low quality feed, uh, corn stover, and blending that with an, an energy and protein feed, such as the silage grains. So what they saw was it was nearly a one-to-one -one replacement um, when they did this. And so one pound of that, this supplement corn stover modified almost replaced nearly a pound of forage on a dry matter basis. And so, um, and, and of course the amount they provided, they actually saw that reduction in forage intake of 30, uh, 35%. And so I think there's some, some tools we have available to us to look at, at what we know about some research and, and kind of think through that in a very similar situation, instead of, um, um, corn stover. Now it was wheat straw. And so, as you can see in this table here, the wheat straw to wet distillers grains ratios across the top there. So moving from 30% distillers to 50 from left to right. And what they saw actually was in that same forge replacement, if we look at the bottom there, they replaced or tried to anyway, half of the forage intake on pasture. And, I, and they did that pretty well. And they almost got a one-to-one -one replacement. So it seems like if we use these very low quality wheat straw, corn stover, blend it with a high energy uh, and high protein feed, we can actually replace some of the pasture uh, uh, that those, those cows are gonna consume. So we've talked or kind of want to move from substitution or on pasture to what if you don't even get to get, go out there, right? We talked dry mm -hmm. lotting and, and, and Carl outlined kind of those favorable situations where th this may work depending on your, your calving season. And I wanna make sure when I talk about limit feeding, I'm really talking about providing an energy dense diet, right? Mm -hmm. We're not limiting a low quality forage in that sense. We're making sure we're meeting the nutrient requirements, the TDN and the protein, and we're doing it at a concentrated level, right? To reduce the amount of, of concentrates, the high feed, you know, that high feed prices, trying to limit that. And so there's certainly been lots of work. We have a publication that, that outlines even some example diets and the dry lot beef cow calf production uh, publication that we have, but it's very doable. And, and so limit feeding really kind of gets at that less than 2% of that animal's body weight. But I think it's important if people are considering this, we can't forget the calf. We've got to be able to provide not only that 2% or less um, uh, percent of body weight on intake, for those cows, we've got to keep in mind those calves, especially once they get two months old, three months old, they're really starting to consume about a percent of their body weight, percent and a half even. And so, so in that situation, do you know, and cows are all calves are all grazing with the cow, the calf mimics what the cow's doing, it's grazing the same thing. In a feedlot situation, are the cattle or in the dry lot situation, are the calves eating out of the feed bunk with the cow and you're limit feeding, are they getting access to enough? Or is this situation really, if you're going to do dry lot with cow calf hairs, you really need to have a creep area for the calves? You... But yes, that's a great question. I've got some pictures here. Uh, um, oh. So let's just move from, uh, let, make sure you provide about two feet of bunk space when mm -hmm. we limit mm -hmm. intake here. 
that means that that feed is going to be consumed pretty well right after feeding for the most part anyway those mm -hmm. cows will slick it up and so you want to make sure every cow has enough space at your bunk area or even if you're providing it on the ground to to hit that and, and then also providing space for those calves so to your question then um limit feeding you need to provide space for those calves in, and whether that's at the same bunk as the cows, I think that's preferable in creating almost a creep area. If you can block off a section where the cows can't get at that bunk, but you can still provide feed, they would definitely follow that area. They also probably need a loafing area. And so that far right picture, this is some, some um, work I did in graduate school. We just simply put a hot wire in a pen and those calves could go under that hot wire and, and into that grass and hang out and get away and, and, uh, um, try to create a, a dry spot too. And when we're dealing with dry lots, it isn't always dry. I like that. I matter with the picture. I like to point out with the calves there. Um, you need to make sure the feed bunk is sized to the calves. Yes. I mean, some of them reach in the bottom. That That's one right. little one looks you like can. he's still staring at what's yeah. going on there, but yeah. I certainly like that loafing area idea. That's certainly, yeah. Yeah. That's a nice place for calves to get away. I encourage people when they are limit feeding, it can be a scary thing thing to think about or, or a, such a new idea to use body condition scores to help you guide. Obviously, we need to get someone um, that has can help balance rations uh, in this case and things like that, but utilize body condition uh, and monitor it quite often. At the bottom there, we kind of recommend, you know, doing it 90 days before calving. Well, we're probably past that at this point, doing it at calving and then reevaluating leading up to breeding season. But if you're going to be in a limit fed situation for an extended period of time, it's a good idea to, to be monitoring that condition over the course of, you know, every month and periodically checking in on those females and make sure you are hitting those targets in, in terms of nutrition. It's important to look at body condition scores or just the body of uh, the condition of our cows. If you're starting off with cows or body condition scores, Kevin, um, if you look at the data, uh, they can lose a little bit of weight and still breed up fairly well. It's when you get to about a condition score four that reproduction drops off quite a bit. So be sure to avoid thin cows. Although when you're in this type of situation of drought, you might have managed cows to lose a little bit of weight over the winter time. Just be careful how far you go before you are on the tip of this iceberg that leads to a reproductive wreck. That's right. That's yeah. right. And so, as I said, if this is something you're thinking about, but uh, necessarily haven't done before, um, reach out to an extension specialist or, or encourage you to go to your county agent. They have the capabilities. They have a ration balancer tool brands is what the one we use. And so they'll be familiar with that and, and can work through some of the um, scenarios that you may want to play out in terms of different feeds and things like that. As well, Carl already hit on this, but when we're dealing with alternative forages and, and feeds that you find, make sure you test those so you know what you're actually dealing with. That'll, that feeds right into that ration balancing uh, and, and your agent can plug those actual values right in. So we know what we're dealing with. And uh, um, of course they can work through balancing that on a least cost uh, basis. And so I just kind of wanted to highlight, Carl already did a great job, that when we move from late gestation to early lactation, you can see there, I've just outlined the amount of protein and um, uh, pounds of protein and pounds of TDN energy that we need going from late gestation to early lactation. So it's really important as we look at pasture turnout, possibly coinciding with early lactation. And don't forget we're leading into breeding season, right? Right to follow that we are making sure those cows get the right amount of energy and protein they need. Well, now comes the question of how do we figure out what we should buy? costs a lot of money to feed these cows. So uh, I always look at the issue of looking at calculate our cost per pound of nutrient, whether it be energy or protein, you calculate it. It's, I always say it's pretty easy math, but it seems like people always get confused doing it. Um, it's just the price per pound of the nutrient. That is equal to the price per pound of the feed divided by the nutrients content. So here's an example here. We're going to look at TDN, which is a measure of energy, right? And our feed costs $250 a ton. That's actually corn at seven bucks a bushel. Uh, it's $250 a ton, so that's 2,000 pounds because we're going to do our cost per pound, not cost per ton. And then we divide it by the as-fed TDN value, which on this example is 76.5% TDN. So you take that, do the math, divide, 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 and you end up with 16 cents per pound of TDN. And that's what we uh, do the math to find out if other feeds are worth that same amount. 
I'm going to head move yeah. on. And then there's another way that, because we don't always buy feed that's dry or air dry. We end up buying feed that's wet, silage, uh, distillers grains, uh, beet pulp, all those have moisture. And so we should probably actually be more correct and use a dry matter and now do the dry matter basis routine to it, which means we just added another value there. That means we divide. So if you see down below, it's cost per pound and TDN are $250 in our previous example, divided by 2000 pounds, divided by the dry matter TDN value, which is 90. And if you don't know what that value is, Go to that publication we just talked about earlier, that AS 1182 alternative feeds for new for feed stuffs is in the back of the page. And then there's the dry matter value there on that same column. And this is 85% uh, dry matter. So you divide, 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 and divide. And <laughs> <laughs> just got to remember divide. You're really tempted to multiply. Don't. You got to keep getting a number that's bigger and you end up with uh, our 16 cents per pound of TDN value. And in this example, TDN is our measure of energy content. We could do the same thing with net energy for maintenance. It's just a little bit different math as long as you're comparing everything. And you do the same thing for crude protein as well. Here's a, a table of different feedstuffs available in North Dakota with some recent prices. Um, may, maybe you wanted to say a few words about this first, Zach, and then sure. I'll say some comments. Yeah. So Carl goes around and gathers prices from different areas, different plants of all these different types of feeds. And so what I just did was those calculations Carl just went through and I did it on a dry matter basis. And so what you're looking at is just the as fed amount or what you would buy it from the plant and then worked all my way through protein uh, dollars per pound of protein and, and dollars per pound of TDN. Usually it's cents we're looking at. And so those three highlighted, of course, if we set, uh, think through corn sets the price kind of for a lot of our energy feeds and a lot of our feedstuffs in general. And the two I just wanted to highlight quickly here was distillers grains and wheat mid in the sense that they're both the, some of more of the economical uh, on the protein side, as well as on the energy side. So those two really factored in, and these are relatively uh, new prices or, or not that old yet. And uh, those both factored in quite well on both protein and energy basis. Yeah, if you look at just the cost per pound of energy of, of feeds, you find out that corn was is one of the cheapest ones out there, which is what we talked about earlier. Uh, wheat mids can end up being fairly competitively priced too. Of course, this market always changes and fluctuates. Sometimes it's not. It's higher than what corn would be unless, of course, wheat mids, all the starch has been milled out of it. What's left over is fermentable fiber so and some protein. So it, it certainly uh, is an option. If you look at protein prices, that's the crude protein up there under CP. Uh, the cheapest one is, uh, well, distiller's grains. That's right. When you look at some of the protein mills, a sunflower mill, uh, soybe soybeans really expensive. But if you look at uh, uh, wheat mids, they're all that, that same area. But what I like to bring out is distiller's grains is one of our cheapest sources of protein. And it's actually an excellent source of energy, like you just said. So no wonder it's used in all of our rations. Yeah. And with that, we'll go ahead and use some more rations. And uh, so I put together some situations here that look at a cow herd. It's going to be July, June and July, and we're going to have to feed them because we don't have enough grass out there. Uh, even though we're getting some snow today around here, uh, how much grass are we only going to get? We don't know. We're just going to have, let's plan ahead here. If you're a January, February calver, you can wean those calves at this point uh, in June, in July. So now you got a cow that, that can either be fed out on pasture and take less feed, or we can feed her in dry lot. I've got a ration up here to feed her in dry lot. She's a 1,350 pound cow. Um, we only need for her to maintain her weight. Uh, she's only 1,400 pound as a mature weight. So she hasn't lost that much weight. Okay, it's in the summertime. That's a lot different than nutrient requirements in the middle of winter when it's sub-zero and wind is blowing. So it doesn't take as much feed. Um, we recognize though, some cows will eat more than this. They might be bigger. They might have more energy needs. Maybe they're just gluttons and want to eat a lot more. Whatever the case is, need to watch the conditions of the, uh, of the cattle and use this as a guide. Here I used eight pounds of grass, say eight pounds of corn stover, a pound of corn grade and some extra energy and four pounds of dried distillers grains to add energy and protein. The total cost of that turned out to be $1.68 a day. 
Not bad. Actually, I think some people are spending three bucks a day this winter to feed cows. Uh, it's it, okay. That's a pretty reasonable ration price. And we're using grass hay at $150 a ton and Stover at a thousand at a hundred dollars a ton, almost at a thousand. Maybe it should be people <laughs> want to pay that much. Uh, but if you're going to wean the calves, you're going to have to feed them too. So we're going to have 400 pound calves. We might have going to feed them. Let's make them gain and uh, give them some weight. They can gain three and a half pounds a day. If you give them the feed to allow them to gain that much, it'll be a ration. that's actually going to be pretty heavy and concentrate. So it's, I've got two pounds of grass hay, two pounds of corn silver, four pounds of corn grain and five pounds of distillers. It's not balanced for calcium and phosphorus. So unless you add in limestone at uh, two ounces per per day and your cost then is about $1.46. So if you combine the two together, you're spending over three bucks a day to feed a cow calf pair, even though they've been separated. Uh, come next June if we don't have grass. Three bucks a day, wow, what is that? Got to do the math in my head. I'm not going to do it right now, but if you start looking at what that, what a cost of pasture would be, pasture is usually a lot cheaper than buying feed for your livestock. That's why we really want to have pasture available. But if we don't, we got to go to plan B and here's plan B. Well, if you're calving in March and early April, June and July is kind of a tough time because that's right when the cow has hit peak lactation. You really can't wean the calf at that time because he needs the milk. You're feeding them. If you don't have grass, you're going to be in dry lot and we got to give them enough feed. So it's a little bit different. They're same cow, 1,350 pounds, only going to gain a little bit when she's not losing weight, just gaining a little. Um, we're feeding the cow. We can either give her a ration that's 16 pounds of hay and stover plus another 12 and a half pounds of dried distillers, grains, and corn. And we end up with a little bit of limestone too, or a mineral mix that would be high in calcium and low in phosphorus and are spending two and a half, two, two, $2 65 cents a day to do that. Or you can change it around and use a little bit less grass, hay and stover at six pounds, uh, 12 pounds together between the hay and the stover. And then we boost up the corn and distillers accordingly. And surprisingly, we only changed our ration by five cents. It just costs a lot to feed. I use prices that um, I think are reflective out there in the market. And like I said earlier, everything's based off the corn grain price, which means everything's just um, a higher price. Well, now let's go to May and June. So what I say earlier, it costs two sixty five dollars a day to feed these lactating cows. Well, here we got a mate. Well, they're on the backside of lactation is what I should have said. They're not at the peak, they're at the backside of lactation. They're starting to decrease their nutritional needs. These cows just calved in May and June, they're just hitting their peak lactation. So the ration has to be better to maintain the weight, mm -hmm. okay? So they're getting eight pounds of grass hay, eight pounds of corn stover, nine pounds of corn grain, which is quite a bit, and six pounds of dried distillers, but we're feeding the milk cow here. Oh, I'm sorry, they're a beef cow, but she's milking. And it costs almost $3 a day to do that. Say we don't have enough stover and we're going to feed more grain and a little to offset the, the stover and hay that we don't have. And surprisingly enough, our feed costs still end up at $3 a day. Just alternatives for you to consider on what our feed prices are and what we can do. So I thought I'd just share that with you. And there's lots of options and ways in which to feed cattle. By all means, please consider what they need based on their stage of production. I, uh, I want to kind of... I'm not going to go through all of this right now by any means. I want to get Brian's opinion in here um, and, and get him talking. But uh, basically, in a similar situation, I put together some diets and looked at if, if we're going to consider a lactating cow 45 days, or excuse me, a lactating cow with a 45-day-old calf, right? Just getting into peak lactation. I just gave some basically some ratios of different dry matter inclusion rates, dry matter mine. I'm assuming Carl, yours were an as fed, yeah, they right? Were. The amounts yep. you actually provide. So these are dry matter amounts in, in terms of ratio, right? And you may notice some of these won't equal hundred percent and that's because I don't have limestone in there, but all those hmm. with an asterisk have included some limestone because those involve distillers grains or wheat mids. And so we want to make sure we're balancing our calcium with our phosphorus when we get in here. But to work through these just kind of quickly, I started from most expensive at the top, which might look similar to just supplementing some distillers grains with some grass hay alfalfa blends. And then you can see those prices on the far right and how much you'd have to feed on a as fed basis there in the third column. And then I worked my way through or kind of a whole bunch of different scenarios to try to find some of that least cost basis. And you can see at the bottom there uh, with $50 uh, corn silage per ton, and dry distillers grains right now had the best price of all the distillers grains. Hmm. Um, so compared to modified or wet. And so including wheat straw, 
and corn silage, wheat mids and distillers grains and several different combinations came up with some of those rations that were actually, to my surprise, two and a half down to two and a quarter. And so trying our best. Now those are all limit fed, right? And so we're limiting the amount we're providing and, and to reduce the amount we need to actually to provide and still meeting those TDN and energy uh, protein requirements, excuse me. But kind of with that, I think, uh, Carl, let's move into, we mentioned here, and this is, this is where I want to transition into to, and see what Brian has to think about some of this. Um, but we did mention, you know, at some point, um, if it becomes too uh, costly and you can't just simply find the availability for your feeds, maybe you have to send cattle where there isn't a drought right now. There may be high feed prices across the nation right now, but certainly there may be some more favorable places to feed these cows relative. We hate to see that happen. Of course, uh, no producer wants to do that. But if you do think in mind of, you know, um, destock or send these cows off uh, in the amount that maybe uh, you anticipate you know, whatever your pasture stocking rate can be, and that's the amount you use in order to send off, you know, certainly doesn't have to be the whole herd. And then I think, I think replacement heifers are a good one to utilize, good candidates. Um, you're not sending pairs, you're not sending pregnant females <laughs> off, mm -hmm. right? And not trying to deal with that. And so you're, you're looking at, and those are going to likely be your highest costing females in, in terms of you're um, trying to provide for them if you do, don't have the pasture and things like that. The, that feed cost for those heifers certainly is going to be. So if you can find a, a, a heifer development operation, mm -hmm. you know, obviously that would be ideal, but certainly um, consider those. And then out-of-state requirements, brand inspection requires, uh, is required as well as health certificate. Um, if, if those animals are going to leave the state and come back, of course. Uh, I do got to throw out uh, that um, be sure to look at Farm Service Agency, the USDA, and some of their programs that are available. I know there's been a change to the ELAP program, the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program, so that there is a livestock, well, the Feed Transportation Assistance Program, a part of the ELAP program, is available. And just recently, uh, I think they announced, I don't know if the rules are out yet, but they announced that... Uh, um, they were paying for transportation to feed to your home. Now they'll provide some assistance for transporting cattle to feed, which is a little bit different. So by all means, please check out those programs. And of course, uh, what, what the emergency livestock relief program just came out this week. So if you're short on feed and funds to feed, uh, at least that might provide some help to producers as well. If you haven't heard about that program, by all means, please go to your FSA office and inquire. Brian, we've been hogging the stage here. And, and, and so lo we'd love to hear kind of your thoughts as, as we kind of work through some of these different things and, and gain your opinion on, on some. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I've done some presentations in the past, uh, put some stuff together on uh, scenarios for how to handle your or manage your herd for uh, during, during drought. Um, I haven't been in North Dakota long, but it seems like I've been dealing with drought every year I've been here, which is good, I guess, in the sense that uh, I'm from Southwest Nebraska, where just about every year is is a drought as well. So, uh, so some some experience dealing with that. And I know that uh, these guys talked about um, different rations and some some changing uh, of of feed stuffs that you can do based upon uh, you know the desired outcome and, and prices. And so I'm just gonna do a quick. Uh, put up a few uh, slides real quick just to uh, kind of take us through a conversation I want to have and then and then talk about it here. All right so as, as was discussed you know feed prices uh, have been high but so so have livestock prices as well. So when we're, when we're talking about what the best management strategy is uh, as an economist we wind up having to um, sort of juggle a lot of variables all at the same time to try to uh, determine what 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 we're actually going to do, and you know when I was doing the the feedlot school and and things like that down uh, up in Carrington as well, you know feed costs being high are fine as long as uh, as long as the uh, the price of the uh, animals and livestock are high as well. Uh, still showed that uh, we were able to make a profit doing that, and I only say that to say that if we're spending, you know as Carl said, good large large quantities of money to dry lot or feed cattle over the summer, 
Yeah, that's 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 a tough pill to swallow. But at the same time, if if cattle prices remain high, it's 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 not so uh, not so difficult. But this chart here just kind of shows uh, the corn belt average price of corn uh, uh, for the the blue line is twenty twenty two. You know, and it's getting up in that seven seven dollar range uh, now per bushel, which you know the last time we saw prices like that were you know the late two thousand ten decade that. Uh, eight, nine and 10 period where they were corn was up over eight bucks. And obviously that's having a big impact on DDGs, which is kind of approaching that almost $300 a ton mark, which uh, I know we use quite a bit of in, in North Dakota. And then I just pulled this from uh, Minneapolis and some of the stuff that was being talked about being fed like a uh, soybean meal, 46.5%. This week was selling for around, let's, let's call it $430 a ton. Uh, which is which is which is getting up there, but you know it's similar to where it was last year. Linseed meal up around three hundred fifty dollars a ton, significantly higher than last year. Uh, sunflower meal uh, that's that's up over three hundred dollars a ton as well, and then canola meal is approaching four hundred dollars a ton. So some of these, a lot of these alternatives, unfortunately, have all moved in the same direction as your more, I guess call it uh, common feeds like like uh, corn or, or soybean meals and stuff like that they've they've tended to move that direction as well with all the all the other commodities so while doing some mixing uh, and, and Carl does a great job as he runs through these scenarios on the on the least cost yet objective driven ration that you're looking for when, when commodity prices like soybeans corn DDGs and everything else is going up it tends to drag everything with it at the same time so you know, you're not going to run into the scenario where you're, you're going to find cheap meal and, and really expensive corn or something like it, it's not going to happen. It's going to be at the margins that those adjustments matter and they do matter, but, but, but it's going to make somewhat marginal differences. Um, not, not major differences. Okay. And this, this one here just shows soybean prices. What's happened. You got May of last year, you know, Kind of dipped here in November, and then we're we're approaching 16, 17 bucks a bushel um, nas nationally. So dragging those prices up, and then we talked about hay already, and and like Carl said, it's pretty thinly traded in North Dakota. So AMS doesn't really track hay sales in North Dakota, but they have some a around uh, uh, South Dakota and Minnesota is what I look at because that you know those are our, our neighboring states, so they're the kind of the easiest to find. You look at like alfalfa hay on average in South Dakota in 2020 was about 100 bucks a ton. You know, that, that looks pretty good. And, and, and other hays around, you know, that'd be more like your grass is around 80. And then you even, and then you look at last year in South Dakota, uh, and mostly I want to look at like alfalfa, 200 bucks a ton for what's quality. And there's, there's differences in these qualities. So when you're pricing hay, you know, your Supreme and your premium stuff, those mostly go to folks either dairy or people raising horses or something like that. That's that's where that, you know, you as a beef cow producer, you, you can't really afford to pay those those prices. But your good to fair alfalfa hays or what's your kind of your your beef quality. And those are going to be probably Carl can uh, chime in on that. But, that you know, 14 percent protein, maybe 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 around that up to 18 percent or, or so would be your your beef quality, you get into that 24 to 26 stuff, that's dairy and horses and stuff like that, that are paying those, those, those kind of money. Um, so long story short, hay prices were basically double from 20, uh, in tw summer of 2021, what they were in 2020. And I saw that comment about $280 a bale. And, and the thing about that is I got it in order for me to say that that's high, low or, or, somewhere in the middle i got to know how what the protein content of it was what was it graded out premium uh good etc so when you're setting a benchmark that that's what what i'd focus on but the bottom line is hay is hay is expensive last year and it's probably going to be expensive this year as well i mean because uh just, just the simple fact that we're going to have some still have some drought stricken areas in western northwestern north dakota especially uh, demand for it to be high. And, and, and it's like Carl mentioned, there's not a lot of hay produced up in that area, uh, not relative to some of these other states. So it's got to be trucked a long way and shipping rates have gone up. I mean, we've got the price of diesel fuel up over $5. Um, and so that's something you got to think about there too. You pay $220 a ton, but it costs you another 
$80 a bale to ship it up there and all of a sudden you really are spending $300 a ton. Now I want to talk about, this is just a quick comment on ranch land rates. So our Minneapolis Federal Reserve uh, covers our area, our region. And when I read this report that this little paragraph came out of, I was a little surprised that pasture land rents went up so high, suppose 13, 14%. But then it, then it occurred to me, you know, if you've got a drought area and somebody has available grass, you know, supply and demand, demand stayed at least the same. Maybe it's went down a little as people did a deep coal, but supply has been shrunk due to the drought and the, and the pressure and the, and the, and the difficulties with raising your, your forage out in your pasture. So for these rents to jump up 13, 14%, I guess, shouldn't be a surprise in our region, given the, the drought pressure. So that's something to think about too, is that rental rates for actual pasture land, what available grass there is, is going to be much higher uh, than, than before, especially during a drought season. Oops, what I do? I'm gonna move that one. Now, like I said, though, cattle prices uh, have been pretty strong. Uh, the green line is 2022. And so feeder cattle, the index was around a hundred and $160 per hundred weight, which is pretty good just this time of year on average. And 2021 kept them pretty high. Why do, why do we bring that up? Because the value of your herd is important when you're determining how much you're actually going to feed them. Now, I will say this, and I think uh, Tim Petrie's on this uh, uh, watching this, so I, so I got to say it. If you're going to pay the kind of prices it's going to cost to be able to feed your, feed your herd over the summer and not thin them too much, you've got to take advantage of some of these prices while they're high as well. You're going to have to use some of the tools uh, that are available um, in order to lock in these. It's the same story I tell uh, the crop producers that if you're going to pay $1,500 a ton for fertilizer, we really need $7 corn and, and then we're okay. Well, if I'm going to pay $3 a day or $3.50 a day uh, to feed a, feed a cow or something like that, I'm going to need to get a pretty good value out of the calf um, in the fall. And, the only, and right now, prices are pretty strong. Uh, maybe they wind up going up a little bit, but, but pricing some of these, getting yourself one of the, the uh, uh, contracts that are available now that you can use, um, um, I think that's an, an important step. So one of the biggest questions we get calls on during a drought is, should I keep my cows or should I sell my cows, right? Carl even put up the choice there. He said, do you keep or do you sell? Well, there's a lot of research that's been done out of Wyoming and some in Colorado at Colorado State University on discussing what you do. And the answer is a mixed management strategy is pretty much the best option under any scenario. Now, how that strategy shakes out is, is again, there's, there's some nuance to that as well, but it depends on all these factors. And what I mean by a mixed management strategy is we don't sell all our cows. We don't keep all our cows. We've got options. You can keep some, whatever forage you have available. You put them out on grass. Uh, you do some feeding, whatever is kind of feasible. You may have to do some shipping of the animals as well, and then possibly a deep cull. And selling out completely liquidating if you plan to stay in business is is probably going to be it's the least expensive in the short run but it's probably going to be the most expensive in the long run because buying back and restocking because what's think about this scenario you have a major drought and this has happened before you have a major drought over a large area and a bunch of people wind up selling cows right so what happens to the number of breeding aged cows in the next year or so? It declines because large quantities of folks have sold and uh, during the drought to uh, basically cover uh, cut costs. And uh, so then so then what happens two years later to the price of heifers because the size of the herd shrunk? Well, the price of heifers winds up going way up. And now it's now I've got my grass back. I've had some rain. Everything's looking pretty good. So I want to get back into the business. But now I got to buy two hundred twenty five hundred dollar bred heifers, a la two thousand and twelve to two thousand and fourteen. That's pretty much that's an extreme example, but that's exactly what happened. So it, folks that were actually able to maintain their herd, or at least most of it, uh, were able to reap the benefits or basically make their money back, whatever it cost them to 
to keep their herd intact in 2012 and 13, made it all back in 2014, right? On the, on the higher end of the price, price range uh, during that period. So that's something you, that, that, that's something to think about and keep, uh, keep under consideration as well. Now, how much of each one of these you do may be dictated by, or is going to be dictated by uh, uh, weather and, and, and your resources. You know, when we discuss about it, so you would take, for instance, the highest quality, everybody's got a uh, sort of a hierarchy in their herd of quality, right? You've got this group of cows who you think are your best set, then you've got maybe a second best, then you've got some maybe tertiary animals down, down low. And pretty for the most part, you take the best animals and you put them in your lot. They're the ones that you're going to keep a closer eye on. You're going to be feeding them every day. Uh, they're probably going to get the better ration of all the, all the animals that you have. Then the second amount that you're probably going to keep, you uh, put them out on grass, uh, spread out way more thin than, uh, than otherwise, whatever grass you have available, obviously make that change that stocking rate dramatically due to the drought. And then the third group, you're either going to, you're probably going to maybe do some kind of deep coal with them, or you can ship them. And just a, just a, one comment on trucking cattle. It is, if, if the drought is going to be long, and I've run these numbers several times, if the drought is going to be, and by long, I mean four months, something like that. If, you, if, if they're going to have to be fed four or five months, let's say, it is almost always going to be cheaper to truck them to where the feed is than to bring the feed in, right? Almost always. If it's really short, you know, six weeks, maybe two months, all of a sudden that the, it's not the cost of shipping necessarily, but the, the hassle, the fact that you're going to be loading these animals up, there's going to be a lot of stress involved in dealing with it for the animals. Maybe they wind up losing some weight or you have some, have some health issues with them, might not make it worth it. But if it's going to be a long term, uh, if, if the drought looks prolonged, if it looks like you're going to be having them on feed for many, many months, uh, shipping is, uh, is, is, is the better solution. Now that said, finding a location to actually ship them to is a whole nother thing altogether. And there are some, I think some FSA regulations on shipping cattle out of state that you might have to deal with or uh, uh, insurance uh, regulations that you have to deal with. I might be wrong on that though. So factors that determine which management strategy is best, the price of grains, obviously the price of hay, how widespread the drought is, right? Because sometimes droughts can be a little more localized you know, you have a, a pocket in, let's say, northern North Dakota that just hasn't gotten any rain for whatever reason. The Thunderheads roll by and they, they just don't get it. Um, that's a better scenario to be in if you're the one being stricken by the drought because you don't have to go as far to find, to find unaffected areas. But if it's widespread, which they tend to be, uh, you got to think about that too. Everybody in your, their neighbor, uh, your neighbor is going to be thinking the same thing as you. So there's going to be probably a lot of distance with the, with hauling the feed in. Um, and forage is one of the, or hay is, as far as that goes, is just one of the most expensive things you can, you can haul. Because the, I mean, the, the volume, the bulk of it, in, in other words, how many bales you actually get on a truck relative to a, a semi load of a thousand bushels of corn and how far that goes as far as feeding versus uh, what, you know, 10 bales of alfalfa and how long that's going to last. You know, the shipping costs get to be uh, kind of kind of uh, uh, enormous when it comes to shipping, uh, shipping for forage. And then, of course, cattle prices, as I already mentioned. Now, I do want to bring this up real quick. NDSU uh, uh, Extension put has some available tools that folks can use to help you make some of these decisions on what it's going to cost you and uh and can you afford it we've got cow calf break even budgets cattle feeding budgets herd budget tools then we've got that livestock forage disaster payment calculator that the you can find online as well if you're stricken by a drought there's probably a good chance that you might qualify uh for for one of those uh so take advantage of that and then we've got our projected fall and summer grazing budgets so one of the i think i'll stop sharing there there we go so what I wanted to highlight, though, is it's it's almost impossible for us to, uh, as as economists, to put together a prescription for every rancher in the state of North Dakota because everyone's situation's so different. Which is why we don't put out just a blanket 
economic um, comment on on what what ranchers should or should not do. So every everyone's going to have to kind of go in, use some of these tools, use the prices that are put out there, and and the recommendations from Zach and Carl on on uh, on on rations and and body condition scores and do you want to gain weight or whatever and then using some of this mi mixed ma mixed management strategy uh that that i've been talking about here so hopefully uh, we're not making the decision on do we get rid of do we liquidate or do we uh, keep them all i can tell you pr about 99 percent that neither one of those choices are the best choice that it's going to be some version of uh, culling deep, uh, putting what it, what's, whatever you can out on grass, and then keeping some up, up, uh, up in a, uh, you know, in a dry lot, or if you absolutely have to, trucking cattle um, to where to where the feed is, which is in the long run going to be a lot cheaper if the drought is uh, persistent and long. So with that, yeah, I think Brian um, summarized today's discussion quite well. I think we could probably talk forever on this. Uh, certainly is a lot to cover and, and, and whatnot. We want to thank you uh, for tuning in today. And uh, this, will, this was recorded, so it will be posted. Uh, and check those NDSU Extension social media links and, and the YouTube channel. Any last concluding marks? Again, if you have extra information or, or need for more information, please reach out to our county extension agents or our specialists for more information on this uh, drought issues and winter feeding that we're running into and summer pasture turnout. Thank you. Thank you.